I must apologize. It's been many, many years since I have done any appreciable amount of public speaking. And on top of that, I'm an introvert. So you cannot imagine the sheer terror with which I greet full <laughs> people. But uh, on top of that, my voice is weak. If David Strait thinks he has a problem getting heard at the end of the hallway or the other end of the field, he has no idea what I go through. So my voice may be weak and it may give out after however many hours or minutes that we have, but I'm going to raise it anyway. I'm going to overcome my fear of crowds. I'm going to overcome my weak voice. I'm going to stand here. I'm going to stand up, as David said. Second, it's Sunday morning, and many of you would normally be in church. So I will begin by thanking God who created us, who brought us together, who gave us this land, and brought us every blessing of our lives. Has everyone noticed that it's impossible to be grateful and feel sorry for yourself at the same time? So be grateful and take heart. The Old Testament speaks of Abraham as God's friend, and the Hebrew word that is used is arachim, which is a special kind of friendship, the kind in which one friend is willing to give up his life for the other, and vice versa. The New Testament, too, speaks of this kind of friendship, when Jesus says, no greater love has a man than this, when he gives up his life for his friends. That's arachim. Friendship, true friendship, turns out to be very important, doesn't it? I hope and pray that all of us here today, and those listening in, feel that kind of friendship in their hearts and have it in their lives, and accept it one to another, regardless of any differences. May we all be such firm friends of the true God that we dedicate our lives out of gratitude, freely giving of all that we've been given sharing our knowledge and the truth to the best of our ability. Today, I'm wearing a t-shirt that has a big roaring lion's head on it, and the words, Fear not, for I am with you. Isaiah 41.10 And then we have it in the New Testament again. Don't let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. John 14.1 As we square off, and stand up against the impressive power of the state and the great evils of our times, it's natural to feel afraid and alone. I remember the bottom fell out feeling I had when I first caught sight of the corruption infesting nearly every aspect of our lives. Our churches, our schools, and our governments all led astray. I remember how I felt that day, the anger, the pain, the fear, how, I wondered, can I make any difference against an evil this big? But, as God said in Zechariah 4, 6, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. By his spirit in each one of us, the living God can triumph in all things can be made new. Let us have new hearts and flesh within us, new eyes to see, new ears to hear, and may the army of Gideon stand with us, and may we never feel alone. When I talk to lawyers and attorneys, which I do on a regular basis, of course, especially those attorneys who are willing to give up their bar cards and join us, I ask them what appears to be a simple question. Where does law come from? Almost to a man, they believe that law comes from the legislature. That's like believing that babies come from the cabbage patch. <laughs> All law comes from the true God, either directly in the form of the natural laws that we're all familiar with, the law of gravity, the law of thermodynamics, the law of kinds, or indirectly because of God, through the scripture, 
and from the scripture into every other aspect of law. So if you're a lawyer and you don't know where law comes from, that's a big problem. And it's not being taught in the law schools, not at all. The second kind of law, which results because of God, is the law of scripture, which we call ecclesiastical law. I was just quoting some ecclesiastical law, which is codified according to book, chapter, and verse. We're all familiar with this. We've all read the Bible at some point or another if we're Christian, Hebrew, or Muslim. But most of us haven't thought about it as a codification of law. That's what it is. That's what ecclesiastical law is, is the scripture, codified. Third, we have canon law, which is the internal organizational law of the church, which is also codified as articles, chapters, and sections. Notice the difference? Scripture is organized according to book, chapter, and verse. Canon law is organized according to articles, chapters, and sections. What other form of law are we familiar with that's organized according to articles, chapters, and sections? Federal code. Federal code is canon law of the British Commonwealth. Okay? So in canon law, and, and believe me, you're going to have some moments here when you're asking yourself, what does this have to do with constitutional enforcement? I'm getting there, believe me. This stuff is important so that you have a basis. We have canon law, and in the canon law, let me direct your attention to Title VI, Chapter 2, entitled Juridical Persons, Section 1. The Catholic Church and Apostolic See have the status of a moral person by divine disposition. You'll notice it doesn't say the Roman Catholic Church. It says the Catholic Church. So what do we mean by that? The universal church. The, the body of all believers acceptable to God. And that arrives from St. Augustine who observe that there are those who belong to God that are not known to the church, okay? So the church admits that there are believers out there who belong to God, who belong to Jesus, and they're simply not part of their church, okay? That's, they include the entire Catholic, universal Catholic church. And the apostolic see have the status of a moral person, status, where did you hear that one before? David Strait, right? Status. You have to declare your status. Who you are, what you are, where you stand. What, what are you doing? You, and here they're saying, the church is a moral person. Okay? What does moral mean? It means you can distinguish between right and wrong. You have conscience. You have discernment between good and evil. And a person, okay, how can the church be a person? Since it's a whole group of people, right? All right? A church, in the aggregate, can have a person which is unincorporated, but nonetheless has an identity, right? We have a Christian church. And they say that this is achieved, this status is, is granted by divine disposition. What does that mean? Well, Ron Gibson gave you an example of disposition and the disposition of land by the United States Government Trust. Land trust, right? It means a giving out, a, a um, directed kind of giving. So now you've heard the word status, you've heard the word disposition, and what's your status, your condition, your circumstance, are you a free man or a slave, an inpatient or an outpatient, a member or a visitor, a Texan or a U.S. citizen? Status is all about the capacity in which you act. 
and the status that you claim. You can be acting as a father or a son, a debtor or a creditor, an employee or an employer. And as you can see, your status, as in political status, is important. It defines your role, what you're doing, with what authority you act. It might seem a bit strange, but each one of us needs to declare our political status, just as we declare a bottle of French perfume when we go through customs. If we don't know our political status and declare our political status, how's anyone supposed to know? I mean, as I'm standing here with my mouth shut, and you're just looking at me from across the room, you never saw me before in your life, can you tell if I'm an American? Can you tell what language I speak? What law I stand under? No, I'm, I'm just stating it, right? I could be a German from Dresden, or a French woman from Normandy, or a Norwegian. I could even be from Argentina or Patagonia. I can speak any number of languages, and I can stand under any number of laws. So, you can see the problem. Especially from a law enforcement and uh, peacekeeping standpoint, you have to know what you're dealing with. You have to know who that person is, where they come from, what law they stand under. Otherwise, you can't react appropriately, appropriately to them. So, many of you recall my story about how I obtained the IRS master file that was being kept under my name, and how I discovered that according to them, I was a desperado and tax chief running a rum distillery in Barbados. <laughs> Until I declared myself and established my status in the public record, who was to say otherwise? I was a blank slate. Just this representation, this person, this name. And so, but, 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 what do you mean there's no public record of me? I have been papered and licensed and diplomaed and documented all of my life. Everyone knows or has cause to know that I'm Ramona Ellison, born and raised in Gainesville, Florida. <laughs> or what? Stop a moment. I wish it were as simple as just saying that, but it's not. And it remains our responsibility to declare ourselves and our political status as Americans. If we fail to do that, others can just make up whatever they want, obviously, have done so too. Otherwise, we leave the door of conjecture open, and we find that other people have let their imaginations run wild. According to their records, <coughs> Anna Maria Reisinger is a municipal United States citizen running rum in Barbados. Or maybe she's a British territorial citizen engaged in smuggling tea and crumpets. <laughs> or maybe she died as a baby at Memorial Hospital in Nielsville, Wisconsin on a hot day in June in 1956. Maybe I'm an avenging angel from Sirius B ready to run Pope Francis up a flagpole. <laughs> Anything is possible, but until we stand up for ourselves and declare who we are, who we are not, other people, and this is the point, other governments can dream up whatever line they please. So this is why you have to declare your status, just as the Catholic Church and the Apostolic See declared theirs. They declared their organizations to have the status of moral persons. So, a moral person is any person with a conscience able to distinguish between right and wrong. A moral person may also be described as a lawful person, as in a moral and lawful person, meaning that as a body, either your single body or that of an organization that you are part of, can tell right from wrong under the law of the land. So what's the law of the land? The law of the land in the Western world is the Old Testament, which is acceptable to all three major Western religions, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, all hold the Old Testament in common, 
and the Ten Commandments in particular. So, a moral person has a conscience, an ability to discern right and wrong. A lawful person stands under the law of the land, which in this country is the Ten Commandments. So, what do the constitutions have to do with the Ten Commandments? Why is any constitution called the law of the land? Well, it's really not law of the land. It's law of the land in the sense that it's not the law of the sea. The constitutions represent the law owed to us, land lovers, by our seafaring, globe-trotting federal employees. It's the law of the land in the sense that from their perspective, when they come ashore and are on our land and soil, they need to be giving us all of the constitutional guarantees. They need to be behaving according to their limitations. So that's the sense in which the constitutions are law of the land. But the actual law of the land is the Ten Commandments, and always has been. So let's look at the last little bit about the Catholic Church and Apostolic See claim about their status. These two organizations are declared under the authority of divine disposition. Okay, remember what disposition means. They're saying that God gave them the status of moral persons in the aggregate, whether by innate inborn conscience, logical deduction, spiritual discernment, guidance of scripture, of scripture inspiration of the Holy Spirit, or whatever other means. We too can be claimed to be moral persons, and if we accept the Ten Commandments, we can claim to be lawful persons too, because that becomes our law. So it is necessary to declare your status. For example, I am a moral person by the grace of the true God. And most often in the process of declaring your status, you also declare your standing, as in this case, where you're acknowledging the gift of conscience and the ability to tell right from wrong and truth from lies. Those of us so blessed tend to forget that there are those who really don't have an inborn conscience. About 5% of the population has no natural conscience, no inborn, inbuilt sense of right or wrong. They function on instinct, like animals. And the only way they learned anything about right or wrong is by rote learning, the same way that you teach a dog not to jump on the couch. Those people cause problems, and they're hard to recognize, especially if they make it all the way to adulthood without being intercepted and uh, being placed in some sort of therapeutic care or hospitalization. Now, I want to make it clear that none of us have a name. Nobody sitting here in this room is a name to God. When we came into this world, there was no name stamped on our forehead, okay? A name is something that we were given by our parents, okay? It's a given name. It's not natural to us. It's not part of us. It's not us, all right? And God even tells us in the Bible that he will give us a name as our creator in the future. Okay? We don't have a name yet. We're still in that, that yesy anzy there's stage where, just like a baby, can spend a few days or a month or whatever not having an official name. That's where we are as living beings, as souls. What we think of and call our, our name is, in fact, this gift that our parents gave us. It's a person, a mask, a character that we assume, but we own our person the same way that we own a bicycle, or a chest of drawers, or a chainsaw. Now, obviously, since the person is a thing apart from ourselves, and since it can serve many different functions, you can have many different persons, just like you can have, in the example, a <coughs> chainsaw, chest of drawers and a bicycle, right? You can have persons that operate in different jurisdictions and that have different capacities and have different functions. 
These different uses and capabilities and jurisdictions in which persons operate have a logic of their own. You wouldn't use a bicycle to chop down a tree or try to travel across town in a chest of drawers, would you? So it's the same thing with our persons. When the Catholic Church declares its status as a moral person, this immediately creates the idea of immoral persons, and indeed there are some. But what next? Let's look at chapter 6, chapter 2, section 2, the section immediately following their declaration of status by divine dispos disposition. And Can you say that, that number again, chapter 1? It's Title 6, chapter 2, section 2 of the Canon Law. In the church, besides physical persons, there are also juridical persons. That is, in canon law, subjects of obligations and rights which accord with their nature. Okay? Now they're saying that, they're not saying that there are no other juridical persons, but they are saying that within the church, there are these non-physical juridical persons so these juridical persons have, number one, subjected themselves to the authority of the church, right? They are subject to some authority outside themselves within the church. Could be the Pope, could be the Vatican Chancery Court, <laughs> could be any number of, of uh, authorities that they are subject to. And within their subjection, they have obligations and they have rights according to their nature, okay? So, is this beginning to sound like something you're familiar with? Maybe citizenship, where you have obligations and rights? We typically say rights and responsibilities, right? A juridical person is not a physical person. It says it right there in canon law. A juridical person is subject, as in a subject of a queen. And finally, a juridical person has obligations and rights according to their nature. Does baby have the same obligations and rights as an adult? No. Does a king under the feudal system have the same obligations and rights as a serf? No. How about an English subject of the queen? Does he have the same obligations and rights as an American? No. They're different persons. If you're thinking about this, you'll recognize now that we have all kinds of persons, and they proliferate and are established from all sorts of relationships and organizations and networks that we, one way or another, either belong to or don't belong to. If I'm a Catholic, then I'm subject to the Catholic Church. As a member, I have agreed that I'm going to follow this standard and I'm going to respect that doctrine and I'm going to follow the rules of that group, right? So physical persons like this, well, living men or states of the union, which are physically defined by geographical borders, have a different <laughs> character and meaning than a juridical person. And that is the dividing line between fact and fiction, between the realm of the land and soil and us our living selves, and the sea, which is all about offices. Let me give you an example of a juridical person within the Roman Catholic Church structure, a cardinal, Cardinal Manberti, okay? Cardinal is a juridical person, it's an office. 
governor is a juridical person. It's an office. CEO is a juridical person. It's a corporate office. It's something apart from the man. And we see this happen all the time. The president is a juridical person. If it were anything else, how would it be possible for us to have had 45 presidents? Right? The name, the office stays there. And whether it's President Roosevelt or President Nixon or President Reagan, it's still the office is there, the juridical person, which has what? Obligations and rights according to the nature of the juridical person involved. An archbishop in the Catholic Church has different obligations and rights than a U.S. president. And the United States president has different obligations and rights than a president of the United States of America. These are all juridical persons that we're dealing with. A person may be moral or not. A person may be competent or not. You can be competent in one sphere and incompetent in another. We tend to think that adult, well-educated people are competent. Healthy people are competent in another sense. They're competent to walk and run, perform things, tasks around the house. But you can also be incompetent. You can be too young. You can be too sick. You can be too old. You can be mentally ill. There are many ways in which we can be incompetent. And some of us are perfectly competent in one venue or in one activity and totally lost in another. I might be perfectly competent to make a batch of strawberry jam and perfectly <clears throat> incompetent to jump off a high dive and survive. <laughs> Okay, so whether you're competent or incompetent as a person depends a lot upon your own education, your own experience, your skills, and your condition. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the three basic conditions of persons. We can be unincorporated. I'm unincorporated here, standing before you. I'm not part of any kind of um, overreaching thing at this moment. I'm not occupying an office at this moment. Right now, I'm just an unincorporated living being talking to all of you. <coughs> what if I step into an office? You know, I just move over here now, and now I'm the same me as far as my physical appearance and everything, but all of a sudden I become the fiduciary for the United States of America. Okay, well the fiduciary is an office, it's a person, right? So I've taken on a different character, I've taken on a different role, that I have to have different competency. Over here all I have to do is stand here and breathe. Over here I have to have a quite substantial body of knowledge at my command to be able to function and be competent. Okay? Okay, right here, I'm unincorporated. Over here, I'm corporate, but I am still not incorporated. Okay? There is no charter. The United States of America is an unincorporated <coughs> person. It's a holding company. Okay? It's corporate in that it has a name and an identity, right? But it doesn't have the kind of charter that makes it a subjection authority. Can you say that again, please? The United States of America? It's a holding company. It's unincorporated. 
meaning it's not standing in, under any other sovereign authority that gave it a charter to exist, okay? It's corporate, but it's not incorporated. Incorporated means that some other sovereign authority over it created it and gave it a charter, that granted it a charter to exist, okay? So there are three basic statuses for a person to exist in. You can be unincorporated, corporate, or you can go the next step and become incorporated. Can you say one more time the definition of incorporated? I haven't gotten to the definition of incorporated. <laughs> this is like degrees on, you know, imagine it on the horizon line. You've got Unincorporated, corporate, incorporated. Okay? So when you're incorporated, you have a charter that is granted to you by some greater authority, by some sovereign unincorporated entity. Okay? So here, one of the people <coughs> takes on the office of state citizen and become corporate. But unincorporated, right? So now I'm a state citizen. And if I want to, I can go the other step and become incorporated as a franchise of a government, even a foreign government. So basically, this is this is what we have going on here. We have people with a small p, that's us, that's our flesh and blood, right? Then we have people who are state citizens of a physically defined state. And then we have persons, legal persons. And right between here is the line known as the bar. This is the corporate veil between corporate and incorporated is the corporate veil between a living, factual, actual basis, a connection to physical reality and no connection to physical reality is that fast. And this is what Jesus was talking about when he said that the veil between life and death is very thin. But here, for physical, actual, there is a connection to reality, okay? But once we cross that line and become legal persons, there is no such connection to actual, actual living reality. So you've got two worlds here. You've got the world we all actually live in, breathe in, and eat in, and have children, and drive on the roads. And we've got a completely fictional world of persons. And that's the difference between people and persons. Now, as the scripture tells us, God is no great respecter of what? Persons, legal persons, fictions, things that are made up that exist only in our minds. All right, this is this is deep stuff. I'm leading you down a path that you probably never went down before. But when we talk about people, we're talking about people with a small p, unincorporated. People with a big p, corporate. And if we step over that line, over here we're talking about persons. Now, another way to look about at this is if I walk up to you and I make a deal with you to mow my lawn and I give you 10 bucks, we're operating as people, right? That's just me in the flesh and you in the flesh and a little job to be done. 
some kind of train to barter going on here, right? If I step over here, and I'm operating as um, part of a family business, say, uh, Belshara and Sons uh, Automakers, okay? We're all familiar with unincorporated small businesses, right? So here, here I'm operating as a people. Bell Sharon Sons Automakers is a people organization. It's corporate, it has an entity name, it is a business, but it's not incorporated. It does not exist by virtue of any charter from the state of anything. Okay? It's a completely private entity. It didn't ask the state of something, or the state, or the U.S. government, or anybody else, for a right to exist. It was created by me and my family, right? This is our little business right here. It's not incorporated at all, even though it has a name, and it has a function, and is a person in that sense, okay? And I, operating it, I'm a people with a capital P because I'm living and breathing within an actual state of the union, right? There's a physically defined state of the union, and when I cross that line over here into incorporated land and become a person, guess what? I have suddenly changed jurisdictions. Over here, I'm operating on the land. And over here, I'm operating where? I'm either in the international jurisdiction of the sea, or I could be even farther over here and operating in the, the global jurisdiction of the air. So even among persons, legal persons that is, there are differences. I can be operating over here, past the line. I'm a person now, I'm a legal person. I can be operating as a territorial person, or I can be operating as a municipal person in global jurisdiction. In our country, the way this all works out is that, okay, I'm one of the people, I'm living as part of my nation, and I'm standing on the soil of my physically defined state, right? That's my national jurisdiction. When I take a step over here, I start operating as one of the people with a capital P. All right? And now, I'm operating as a state of the union. Okay? Here, I'm a Virginian, for example, or an Alaskan, or a Wisconsinite, right? Here, I'm operating as a state citizen, and I'm operating the state. I'm one of the people with a capital P. I'm not a person. I'm not incorporated by anyone else. I am in existence by the sovereign will of the people, the small b people, creating a government or a physically defined state. This is how we're exercising our authority over our turf, over our jurisdiction, which is the land and soil. Here's the national soil jurisdiction of Virginia, which is a sovereign state. Here's the actual state government of Virginia. And I'm a Virginian right now, okay? And is that the, that's the little state citizen, correct? Okay, this is all well the nomenclature. We'll get into this. This is a small p. This is the big p of people. There's the line in the sand. 
And here's the person. What do persons occupy? Corporations. Corporations. And what is a corporation? It is chartered by a sovereign entity. Okay, so on this side of the line, you have sovereign entities. The people, small p, who live in counties, which are our Republican states, okay? And the people who are operating the, the state, the actual physically defined state government, are not incorporated by anybody else. They are sovereign entities, okay? There's the line. I'm going to step over it. Now I'm a legal person. And a legal person has to have a charter from an unincorporated sovereign entity. Okay? I can't be a person, I can't be a legal person unless there's some other greater authority that gives me a charter and says that I can exist as a legal entity. Whether I'm a territorial person, whether I'm a municipal person, there has to be some greater sovereign structure like the queen who says, okay, I give you a royal commission. I give you a charter. And now you can do all of these things and you can function in a legal fiction capacity under the authority of what? My government. My church. You see how this works? The real power and authority is vested always in unincorporated or corporate sovereign entities. Any power that a legal person has has to derive from a sovereign authority. It can't be any other way, the way this is structured. So what do we have over here in the legal person end of things? This is where the states of states exist. Okay? Right? So here you have the county. Here you have the state. And over here, you've got a state of state. Does that make sense? Everybody got it? Yes. And once you're over here in the airy fairy realm of legal fictions and you're dealing with persons, you can have a territorial person, you can have a municipal person, you can have a person that's standing under a royal charter or commission, or you can have a person that is chartered by what? A state. A state, a physically defined state operated by living, breathing people, which is unincorporated, can charter a state of state. And that's what they do. This is how our government was structured from the get-go. You have your counties, which are your Republican states. They're guaranteed by the Constitution. And everything else that we have is documentary evidence. You have your state, which is physically defined by borders, boundaries, and which includes all of the land within those borders, which is operated by state citizens, right? by the people, capital P. And then over here you have the state of organizations. And the nature and the authority of these state of state organizations depends on what? Who's chartering them? Who's over here in the sovereign capacity giving the charter to a state of state? The that's the that's what should be happening. Okay, that's what should have happened forever and forget go right, and that's the way it was originally structured. Originally, we had our counties, 
which are considered states within the state, okay? We have our physically defined states and then physically defined states governments. The people created and chartered federal states of states, okay? And when you cross over the bar, you go from, you're calling it, uh, basically when you go from the uh, small P to capital P, you still have God given unalienable rights. But when you cross over that bar, now you've got a lot of privileges and immunities that were delegated to you by the sovereigns, right? Yes. Okay. You got it. All right. Now, we each have our county, we have our state. And over here, we have, what, we have international and global legal persons that are functioning in our behalf and under our delegated sovereign power. And you serve power power in that capacity. And presume us, uh, you have given them or granted them our authority, and we didn't know this time. Well, actually, yeah, we do. We do have cause to know all this stuff because it's written down in the documents. And if we would study our own government, know our own history, we would have all of this at our command. But instead, we never taught this in school, so we have to learn it outside of school on our own volition, with our own energy and our own enterprise, which is how all of this is coming to you today. Okay, so. As you can see, one county doesn't have a lot of strength all by itself. It would quickly be overwhelmed by, you know, any number of factors. It could be a foreign government, it could be a state, it could be a whole group of other counties that just decide to come in and take charge, right? So, what do we have? We have a union. That union is called the United States. Upper lower case, the is capitalized. Okay, that's the United States. That's the union of all the 3,100 more counties operating together as one national soil jurisdiction. And I'll get to what soil jurisdiction is in a minute. This is all of the nations operating at that level. This is the United States with a capital T and the is definitely a part of the proper name. Okay? Take a step over here into the corporate but still sovereign realm and what have you got? Ah, you have land jurisdiction states like Virginia, Minnesota, Wisconsin, okay? So, I lost my track here for a moment. This together is called the combined estate. We always speak in terms of land and soil. Over here on the land, we've got the United States of America. Okay, that's also upper lower case. So these two things, the national soil jurisdiction and the international land jurisdiction go together, have to work together hand in hand as a combined estate. Why is that? Okay, well, that gets into the definition of soil and land. Yesterday, Ron Gibson touched on this. He just called it by a separate name, different set of names. He called it the surface and the subsurface estate, or it's sometimes called the soil and the mineral estate. And this comes to us from Roman law through the British land law to America, all the way down for centuries. 
the soil is the surface. And in British land law, it's the top six inches of dirt that overlies everything like a skin on an apple. That's your national soil jurisdiction. <clears throat> soil jurisdiction is, is where your feet land, right? The land jurisdiction is the subsurface estate, and it's variously defined. Different, different countries have different depth of soil versus land, okay? But basically land is everything below that soil surface. It's the, as Ron called it, the subsurface estate. All right, so the soil is on the surface and the land is everything below the soil all the way to the center of the earth. The soil is what's divided up on the surface into counties and into physically defined state borders, right? And the land is beneath that. The land is continuous. There are no borders, per se, on the land. And so it's an international jurisdiction, which is nonetheless claimed according to the borders of the soil above it. Maybe it would be helpful to visualize this like an apple. You have the skin on the apple on the outside. That's the soil. You have the flesh of the apple on the inside. That's the land, okay? But because you can't have one without the other, it's called a combined estate. For legal purposes and lawful purposes, both, there are distinctions between the two. But in fact, you can't very well stand on six inches of soil with nothing underneath. And no matter what you do with the land, you're going to form soil on top. You're always going to have a surface to land. Now people ask me, why is the land more important than the sea? Why does the land take precedence over the sea? All of this goes back in a very logical fashion. Remember, the Romans were the ones that dreamed this up. And they were nothing if not practical, right? So they look at around and they go, oh, well, no matter what you do, Land underlies everything. What happens at the bottom of the sea? <laughs> you find soil and you find land, right? So land underlies, supports, and is more important than the sea because the land is permanent. Whereas the sea goes up and down and shifts around and sloshes up and down, all around, and isn't really that stable. Okay? So that's why land law and land takes precedence over sea law and sea. Okay? So, now we have a basis to discuss jurisdictions. You got the soil and you got the land. And both are unincorporated. One is corporate in that it has a name and has functions. It's a holding company or it's a state government or it's some form of unincorporated business structure here, okay? But both the county and the state, the soil, national jurisdiction, and the land international jurisdiction, on this side of the line, okay? This is an unincorporated law person right here. Did everybody hear that? This is an unincorporated lawful person. Virginia is an unincorporated lawful person. The United States of America Holding Company is an unincorporated lawful person. We're over here on this side of the line, dividing us from persons. We're standing on the land and the soil. Persons are over here. Incorporated persons are over here. 
did you just mistake that then and say that we're unincorporated lawful people? Yeah. You use the term persons. No, I, I mean to say, over on this side of the line, we're people. Right. On this side of the line, stepping across the bar into fictional non-reality, we're persons. Incorporated. Incorporated. Incorporated legal. Legal persons. Legal persons. Legal persons. On the other side of the line. Lawful persons. Unincorporated. Right, exactly. You got it. We have <clears throat> unincorporated people who are living under what? County. County. We have also unincorporated but corporate entities. State, state, state. state. lawful person. And this is a lawful person. We have Alice in Wonderland, they believe, whatever they want, yeah, you call them? misidentified people. Well, one thing legal person. One thing I'd like to interject is on the private side, we have, we can get together in private and form private membership associations of people, private people, and we can operate those, okay? And so that's a, a nice way to look at it. Well, the, the problem with designations of public and private in my my view is that what's private for me is public for somebody else. Right. And it gets confusing. So I, I prefer not to try to make that distinction, but he's perfectly right. This, a uh, private membership organization that's not incorporated, not chartered from some other authority, is basically what a state government is. And religious organizations are made up of members, uh, right? You know, and so and, yeah. And all, all these things that we talk about, like voters, members, those are our persons that are associated with a membership or a an affiliation of some kind that you have. And in this case, what you've got. Is an affiliation because you live within the boundaries of the state. And you can live within the boundaries of the state and be a state national, one of the people with a small p, and have no responsibility or obligation to take an office or do anything for the state government. Or you can choose to operate as a state citizen and stand up and take responsibility for running your own state government, right? This is where you take that little leap to become one of the people with a capital P, and you then take on the responsibility to run a government for your state. You can be a Virginian and never be a member of the state jury pool. You can operate your whole life as a state national and have no responsibility except to keep peace and not bother your neighbors. Okay. <laughs> and over here, you can choose to self-govern. Okay? You can step that one little step over into being a state citizen and take on the obligation of peacekeeping, of which is accomplished by a state militia not a state of state militia, by a juror assembly. You can serve as a juror. You can serve as a judge, as a coroner, as governor. Okay? Public servant. Well, yeah, in a sense, public servant. When you become a state citizen and you join your state assembly, you become part of the jury pool. If you were physically fit and of the right ages, you become part of the militia. You stay as a state citizen, you have some what? Obligations. But along with those obligations go what? 
rights. So a state citizen is a juridical person. Just as we saw the definition of juridical persons written in the canon law, it is a non-physical person, but it's not incorporated, it's not granted you by a charter. It exists apart from any other authority coming down from on high and saying, okay, you can organize this way or you can organize that way, okay? Everybody following along? Quick question, Adam Davis, this goes to you too. So A, USC 1101, uh, what is it, A21, is that the state national or is that the state citizen? Neither. Say Neither. One more time. A, USC 1101, A21, A21, is that the state national it's, or the state citizen? It's the state national. The national. Right. That isn't. A22 is the state citizen. Okay, but look, when you're quoting federal code, you're quoting how they... Perceive us. Yes, that's how they are talking about yeah. us in their system. See, it doesn't apply to us, it applies to them. So if we have to deal with them, we use their code to deal with them. If we're right. dealing with you and I together between men. Right. We got a whole different language. So once you take that little leap over here, and you're way over here across the bar, and you're operating as a legal person, what happens in our original government is you go from the United States of America, oh, wait a minute, I'm sorry, from the United States here as a people, right? To the United States of America, which is an unincorporated holding company. And then you leap across the bar, and over here you have what? The States of America. Okay, and that's the actual name of, of, of this organization over here, the legal person organization, the States of America. No the, just States of America, upper and lower case. Now there's a progression here. Here you have a union of states, the United States, the county governments all over, controlling the soil jurisdiction of each nation state. Here you have the state governments controlling the land jurisdiction, right? And so what happens? The states form a federation called the United States of America. Each state contributes some of its powers. They group their powers together in the international and global jurisdiction that they have the right to exercise independently out here in the international and global jurisdiction. They voluntarily choose for their mutual benefit and protection to take some of their own natural sovereign powers in these other realms and put them in a holding company, the United States of America. And they form what? A federation of states. The United States of America is a federation of states, right? So you have over here a union of states defined as counties, right? Over here you have a federation of land jurisdiction states and a federation of all those powers that are vested in the land and sea. Right here you have a federation. A union, a federation, and then what? Leap over the line. You have a confederation. So, when you are the people of the county, you are the sovereign authority, and then you go to the dependent authority, and then once you cross the line, then you are delegated authority, right? Because each one, the dependent authority is dependent on the sovereigns, and then, right? Okay, in our system of government, all the power is vested where? Right here. Okay, so here's the small thing. 
Here's the big V. They're both people, right? And as I explained, this is the the consolidated estate. This is the soil and the land working together. All right? So all of this is sovereign. All of this is unincorporated. Now you'll notice that when it gets to the constitutions, they're only talking about people with a big P. Okay? The flow of power goes from, yes? I just want to say one of the things that helped me when I was learning the study and all this, because it was saying exactly the same thing I said, Ron said it too. So you've heard it in three different ways. But one thing that helped me and might help you guys, that's why I'm throwing it out here, is if you take a box and you just divide it third and you write L A W at the top, and you listen to her words and you listen to mine and you listen to Ron's very carefully, you'll start to begin to learn the language, the jurisdiction of each three jurisdictions, land, air, and water. You'll be able to put in that box certain specific words. So now when you go into your court cases and you're having problems, listen, because you run into these compartmentalized legal idiots in your life, right? now you'll know what words to say to stay in the proper jurisdiction she's talking about. See? When you mix words in your legal documents and you mix jurisdictions, the courts throws it out or they say, oh, this, this is a, it doesn't mean anything, it's a letter, or it's gibberish, and you go, oh, what do you mean it's gibberish? Everything in here is in, you know, written down somewhere, it's truth, it's fact. What do you mean it's gibberish? The judge says, hey, it's gibberish. No, what he's telling you is, you mixed jurisdictions. You can't do that. Right. You have to keep them distinct and separate. So that's where I learned to just draw a box, divide it to thirds, write L A W at the top, and listen to her words, and listen to his <laughs> words, and listen to mine, and everybody else is out there. And you'll begin to pick up the words, write those words down the box. Now you have three separate dictionaries, one pertaining to each jurisdiction, and that's called legalese. Okay. That's what attorneys are taught. Okay. Okay. Hold yeah. that. Help. Is there um, one of your books that actually diagrams this out? Unfortunately, no, not, not as a diagram per se. At the time I wrote that, I was kind of concentrating on other aspects. No? Um, just to clarify, we heard codes before. Where does codes belong in the code position? Okay, okay, that's a very good question. Where do codes fit into all of this? Where do codes, regulations, and those sorts of things go? All right, okay. On this side, with the people and the people, we're dealing with law, right? On this side of the line, we're dealing with codes, regulations, rules, statutes. Now, When you appreciate how our government was originally set up, it's easy to see how we've gone astray. I'm going to set this up so you can see basically how this goes. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> that was the most exciting thing that happened to me. Uh, uh, I need to see her. I managed to, to really mess up the gizmos here. Okay, we're in the back of business. We got national. National. Here we go. National goes to international. Right? Right. Right bigger. 
So we got national. That's the small b. That's that's the people, right? We got international. That's the big b. That's the people with a capital B. Okay. We got global. And global is what persons. Okay. And right there, that dash line, that's the bar. Like sandbar, right? Okay, here's soil. Here's land. Here's sea. And here's air. Okay, you see how that lays out now? What do you notice? Soil and land are both on this side of the line, both on this side of the bar. Okay? Over here, here's the realm of the sea and the air. All right? Here you go, you've got people, and you've got people, and you have persons, with a capital P, persons, and last but not least, you have persons. With all caps, right? Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, over land, wouldn't it be better described as citizen as opposed to international? You've got national, and wouldn't it go citizen, international, global? No. No. You undertake citizenship or don't. That's a voluntary act. Okay. Citizenship is voluntary. <coughs> And which citizenship you claim is your business, okay? You can act as a state national. Here's a state national. State nationals owe no obligation to the government whatsoever except keeping the peace. As long as you don't bother your neighbors, you don't go out to somebody other's, somebody's land and stomp on them, kill their dog, or steal their chickens, you can live your whole life with not all an obligation to the government in this country. You can also choose, choose to operate as a state citizen. When you step over the line and you become a person, you join the military, okay? You're 18 years old, you get out of high school, you join the military, what happens? You step over the line. You become a territorial person. And that's in this country. You know, this isn't the same, it's not the same way all over the world. I'm just talking here today about us here now, America. Okay. All the guys that are in the military are acting as territorial persons. And if you go a step farther, say you become a a federal civil servant federal 
civil service employee, like a guy at the post office, what happens? Ah, well then you step another click over and you become a municipal person. Okay, that's how it lays out here. So, what David was talking about, in our system of government, where the power comes from the people, right? State national has no responsibility to the government other than keeping the peace, okay? He's what we call private. A state citizen operating, say, as I am, as a justice in a state government, right, is occupying what? What we all, uh, what we recognize as a what? A public office, right? So, <clears throat> now what's the most common public office in America ever? in our entire history? Juror. 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 When you act as a juryman or a jurywoman on a jury and on one of our courts, you are a juror, and a juror is a public office. And what does that mean? You have certain obligations, and you have certain rights. As a, it's why the bar association is trying to get everyone to take a plea deal so they don't have to have juries, so they don't have to accept that responsibility, and they can make a private decision, a private bar deal decision. I want to pause just a moment here and, and examine what it means to be a juror in our government. In our government, in our courts, in the American government, a juror is a very important juridical person. A juror has obligations and they have rights. Okay, remember what I was telling you about the canon law establishing juridical persons and defining them? Okay, okay, so a juror has obligations. What are the obligations of a juror? A juror hears the facts and law and uses their best judgment to arrive at a reasoned decision regarding the facts and law of a particular case brought before it in whatever capacity, whether it's a grand jury or whether it's a trial jury, jury okay? So you have obligations as a juror. You have to sit there and listen to the facts. You have to look at the law. You have to make the effort to understand it all and, and make a reasoned decision to the best of your ability, okay? That's your obligation as a juror in our courts. But jurors also have rights. And here is the most important right of a juror in our American government. It's called jury nullification. Mm -hmm. In our system of government, the ultimate buck stops with the jury. The legislature can go out there and they can make all sorts of laws. Congress can make laws. All these different organizations out there can you know, speak to whatever issues that, that they want to speak to. But where pedal hits the metal in the American system is the juror and the jury. Now, how many of you have encountered in your lifetime or heard in your lifetime of an instance where we have one juror out of a panel of 12 
Come on and breathe. Okay? And that one man or that one woman can stop the whole process. Why? Because they're sovereign. <laughs> See that? Yes, because they're sovereign. They can stop the proceedings. And unless you have a unanimous decision, unless all 12 jurors say, yep, that's the way it is, you can't hang a man for a capital crime in a jury trial in America. And once that jury speaks, there's nothing more to be said. That's it. There's no appeals. And the judge just sits there. <laughs> you know, my responsibility as a justice in one of our courts has nothing to do with judging the facts of the law. That's the jury's job. And if the jury doesn't like the law, if the jury thinks that the law itself is improper, unconstitutional, unfair even, or if they find that the law is too complex, can't be understood, doesn't, doesn't have the, the logic behind it, isn't well defined. All these reasons, the jury can just say, eh, strike that law, nullify it. It's null and void, right? That's the power of an American court and American jurors. That's not the direction they're giving the jury. They're saying the jury right. has to work within the confines of the existing With, law. Well, no, no. That's what they tell them. That's that's, the, what that's, they, that's what that's the other side of the line. That's their courts. Right. <laughs> We're gonna get to there. <clears throat> okay, our courts are a different matter. Our courts have the power of jury nullification. Our courts <clears throat> can say, eh, that's against the Constitution, null and void. Eh, that's unfair. That's basically immoral and unjust. That eh, it's null and void. Right? That's our courts. We have that power because what? We're on the sovereign side of this line. We're unincorporated. Okay? Over here on this side of the line, you got a whole different story. This is where we're being prosecuted. Okay? We're in foreign courts. And these foreign courts operate very differently. Over here, as a justice in an American public court, I just sit there, the jury does its job, they come forward, the jury foreman says, we find the defendant guilty. Okay? And all I do is pronounce the sentence. The sheriff carries it out, and that's it. So your jury decides whether they're guilty or not, and then the justice decides on the, the sentence of how many years or whatever. That's not done by the jury. That's done by you first as the justice. All that we do is pronounce the sentence of the jury. If the jury says the law stands nullified, that's what the justice says. The law stands nullified. And are you going to cover the difference between a jury trial and a trial by the jury? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you say that that's sovereign side? And then I looked up the antonym of sovereign on the Webster dictionary and it says bound, captive, conquered, enslaved, subdued. I couldn't quite hear the first part of that. I said, you said on the left side of this line, it's the sovereign side. Yes, that's, that's the sovereign side. And then I looked up the the opposite of the word sovereign, the antonym, and it says conquered, enslaved, subdued. Right. OK, there's a reason why these are delegated powers over here. That's Guess why what? the military has to follow orders. Right. That's why the military takes its orders from Rome. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay, this is this is also civilian. 
This was the civilian government right here. Not the civil government, although we have civil powers, okay? This is the civilian government. And what we have over here is often called the civil government. Very uncivil. Okay? So we're going to write civilian. <clears throat> I'm going to write military. And we're going to write civil. <coughs> See that? Okay, so we have. Okay, can a territorial person be public or private? Well, oh, yeah, depending there. on which hat they're wearing at the time. It's a trick question. And this is where we get into the problem of my public is their private. Or my public duty is their private duty. Okay, and this gets confusing. These have their own little world. They have their own law. They have their own justice system. Okay, this is a foreign government. The military is its own entity. Okay, it operates under delegated power. But it is a foreign government. Given that both the territorial military government and the municipal civil government are foreign with respect to us, it should come as absolutely no surprise that they have their own courts, they have their own laws, they have their own structure, and it's all foreign to us. Okay? We have law. called organic law. They have code and the municipal government has rules and regulations. Okay? What are statutes for the Are there rules and regulations? It's actually a different level. It's the state of state level where we get statutes. Okay? You said that was a municipal government mm -hmm. on the far right, the municipal the far right is municipal. That's the foreign civil government that um, the, the uh, federal civil service operates on. It's global in nature. So when you think about it, it makes sense. The post office is what the primary function of global civil government. So is the post office global? Yes. You know, that's what makes it possible for me to send a letter to Zimbabwe. All right? So that's why the municipal civil government is part of a global structure. It's not the post office. That actually is under our civil jurisdiction. I'll get to that. But um, when you think about global services or global operations, that's all 
under the municipal umbrella. So how is what is the differentiation between municipal and mun municipalities? Okay, a municipality is an independent international city state. Okay. <clears throat> Washington DC is part of the municipal in that sense government. Okay. We also have civil servants. We have civil powers, but our civil powers are under the United States of America. Okay. Everybody got this so far? That's awesome. If you're charged, as we typically are in the military court initially, and then you move to a jury trial, how does the jury automatically become a sovereign? Does that shift the, the jurisdiction to a, a different jurisdiction when you move to a jury trial? No. Take a look here. Up here we have state, national, state, citizen, territorial person, municipal person, okay? This territorial person is what? How do we, what do we call them? What kind of citizen are they? They are a United States citizen. That's upper and lower case, okay? These other critters, the municipal citizens, are called citizens with a small c of the small t-h-e United States. I'm going to leave this up here and we're going to take a break and you can all come up and... <laughs> okay, so... Goodness me, look how late it is. I'm going to take a break right here. I didn't mean to go this long. Everybody? Your time moderator was That's what I was. Everybody, come on. Without even the door. Thank you, man.